and feel free. <laughs> so thank you so much, friends. I'm out of our busily bustling lives to, to join us and talk about seeds. So tonight you'll see I've re I've pre-recorded an entire how-to video, which is, I confess, it's an hour. So I won't mince words here at the beginning. We're going to dive right in. And I pre-recorded it so that I can hang out in the chat. I've got my computer right here. So I'll be hanging out in the chat, bring any and all of your clarifying questions as we go along. And then at the of the presentation, the pre-recorded webinar um, that you'll actually find housed in our webinar library on our website very shortly after this. Um, and after that hour-long presentation, pre-recorded, we'll have some live Q&A. So please stick around and save all of your questions and I'll go forward to joining you for that live Q&A in an hour. And in the meantime, I just wanted to open up with a few little questions for you. Um, question, how do you get access to the pre-recording? You're actually about to watch it here on the Zoom screen. It's going to pop right up and I'm just going to be hanging out <laughs> and typing in the chat live along with it. Um, and then you'll also get access to the replay, um, but don't worry, you don't have to go anywhere for that pre-recording. It's going to pop right up for you. And to begin, I wanted to ask you all a few questions and <laughs> a raise of Zoom hands. How many of you <laughs> love to garden? <laughs> yes. And how many of you have saved seeds before? Raise your hand, jump in the chat and say, yes, yes, yes. Or no, 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 but I want to. And how many of you have developed brand new varieties of vegetables, of flowers, of herbs, something the world has never seen before? Yeah. And you woke up this morning, put on clothes, and ate something for breakfast. <laughs> right? All hands, all rise. So here's the thing you all are changing the world more than ever realize. Even if you've never sown a seed in your life, every day, if you you eat. And every dollar you spend on food, on clothing, funds, the plant breeders of the world, those people that are saving seeds that are entirely deciding what the future gen all future generations to come, what access to genetics they will have. So you don't even have to sow a single seed in your life to have a profound impact every day on our food on our seed system, on the world that our great, great, great grandchildren are inheriting. And certainly if you're saving seeds, you're taking it the next step. You are profoundly changing the world to come. And certainly the world today. Step back and just for a moment, in the Peruvian Andes, 6,000 years ago, people were saving seeds, seeds of tiny little grains that I simply would have mown, but people were saving those seeds. Fast forward, this is corn. <laughs> 6,000 years of our brilliant indigenous ancestors selecting and saving seeds. We now have corn grown on millions of acres on six of the seven continents, feeding all of us virtually every day. And I'm pretty confident that if you had asked those people in the Peruvian Andes 6,000 years ago, if they were saving the world, changing the world, they might not have any conception <laughs> of what was happening. And certainly, if you had asked them if they were plant breeders, I doubt they would have raised their hands as well. So if you didn't raise your hand when I asked if you were a plant breeder, a plant breeder, but if you raised your hand and said, yes, if you have saved seeds, next time someone asks you if you are a plant breeder, confidently raise your hand and say, yes, I have saved seeds and that no one else creating new varieties in the world, new expressions of life that no one else has ever seen and have great confidence that you are changing the world and for the better. So 
Thank you for being that change and sowing and saving that change you wish to see in the world. And without further ado, perhaps mind hitting play. And again, we're just going to watch recorded webinar that you'll find on our website and our library of webinars um, very soon. Um, but I'll just be hanging out here in the chat. So if you have clarifying questions, don't be shy. We're here to help. And after this hour long little pre-recording, we'll have some live Q&A, which is kind of my favorite part of the day, of the week, of the month. I'm really glad you're here. <laughs> Seeds. Seeds saving. Saving ourselves. Seeds are living, breathing beings. They literally respire just like you and I. And when people ask Matthew and I if we have children, we laugh and say yes. And great, great, great grandchildren. And we put them in baggies. And if we think they have a sense of humor, we say, and you can eat them. But certainly, you can save them too. And I hope that you do. I'm Petra, I'm Petra Page Man. I'm one of the co-founders of Fruition Seeds and we grow organic, regionally adapted seeds for short seasons, for so many reasons. Among others, I grew up right here in the Naples Valley, Zone 5 in the Finger Lakes of New York. And I thought I couldn't grow watermelons. I mean, I could grow them. I just wouldn't eat many watermelons at the end of the season. and turns out, fast forward, there's this thing called regional adaptation, also genetic diversity. And I can totally grow watermelons here. I just need different seeds. And also, I have to just shout out my father before we go any farther, because we save seeds in my father's garden. And not all of our fresh seeds by any means, just a few, just the easy ones, some beans, some tomatoes, some lettuce, and I didn't think anything as little seven-year-old Petra, what she loved to do, I never would have told you seed saving. I also wouldn't have told you gardening. I also wouldn't have told you brushing my teeth. It was just foundationally what we did. And I think if you had asked me, like, why do you save seeds? I'm like, well, you want to sow some seeds, right? So you need to save some. And I'll always be grateful that my father offered this loop to me, this feedback loop of understanding, even if he didn't fully understand the dynamics and what was being taught in that moment. So friends, let's dive in. I'm so honored to share with you all of these things that I love and have gotten to know about seed saving, and I'm honored to share with you today some words that I would love to share. Also some thoughts around seed saving versus seed selecting, and then we'll dive into the nitty, into the gritty of kind of the foundational biology, also some terminology, the foundational questions to ask yourself. If you want to be saving seeds, yes, here are the key questions to set you up for success, as well as I'm gonna share the easiest seeds to save. It's quite a lovely and surprisingly long list. There are also things that are not so easy to save, and here are the things that I will share that are the easiest ones. Even this season, perhaps, that you can, even if you haven't fully designed your garden around seed saving, that you can still nonetheless save. And then I'm excited to share a little demo of seed cleaning because that's really fun as well. And then we'll talk about seed storage, how you can save them for next year with the greatest <laughs> optimization, whether you save your own or just saving your seed collection from all kinds of folks. And then I'll share the common mistakes as well. Um, so I know that's a lot. Let's dig right in. So first and foremost, I would love to read you a bit of an article I'm about to publish on our blog. It was published last winter in the Small Farms Journal, an amazing journal. I, found, I fell in love with this publication over 20 years ago when I fell in love with horsepower as opposed to tractor power <laughs> because they're very oriented in horse <laughs> power and that world. But they share lots of really amazing information. When they asked me to write an article about plant breeding, I said yes. And I know you're thinking perhaps, is this plant seed saving, seed saving or plant breeding? And we will get there. <laughs> So yes, this is called, the title of this piece is called, We Are All Plant Breeders and All. Five Approaches to Adaptive Seed Stewardship. They told you 
to order from the catalog, to plant in tilled soil, to get big or get out, to dig in, to fit in, to simply follow the instructions on the package. They promised you yield and markets, profitability, prosperity. They sold you stability and security if you would just do what you're told. They sold you big tractors with bigger debt and small patented seeds with a certain social grace with less than a living wage. And now we know we reap what we sell. In the last century, farmers and their communities have been uprooted from our 10,000 year legacy, the seeds themselves. As seeds have moved from commons to commodity, it is no longer common to find a farmer growing their own seed, much less involved in any breeding process, and yet we are with every bite. Let's get to work, friends. But first, let's step back. Let us all remember, we come from a great lineage of farmers, of seed stewards, of indeed plant breeders. From 10,000 years ago to a century ago, to be a farmer was synonymous with being a seed saver, which was in synonymous in turn with being a plant breeder. Keen observation, thoughtful selection, and appreciation for diversity across the millennia have surrounded us with all the agricultural crops we know, we love, we depend upon. As Joseph Lofthouse loves to remind me, everything that we think of as agricultural diversity is the genius vision of 10,000 years of indigenous farmers, patient, brilliant, illiterate only by modern standards. Countless generations of enti and entire cultures were plant breeders before DNA was even described, and indeed, modernity has thoroughly roped human interest from our food system. We've all heard the statistics. Over 80% of agricultural diversity we cultivated a century ago is gone, extinct. The Industrial Revolution has kicked us out of our own Eden. There's good news and bad. First, the good news. Even if we never sow a single seed in our lives, everything we eat becomes the statistics and funds that nourish the next generation. article continues with all kinds of great actual strategies for adaptive seed stewardship and plant breeding, which are just you know, seed saving with a little greater intention. So let's talk about seed saving because even if <laughs> you never sow a seed in your life, you are actively funding with every dollar you spend on food, on clothes, the seeds that are being developed that will found every other generation of humans and species to come, all of those cultures intertwined. Yes. And then when you do save seeds, if someone asks you if you're a plant breeder, they're really asking if you've created something that the world has never quite seen before. And to be totally honest, I have never existed before. You have never existed. Hi, everyone. I have stopped the movie and I believe Petra is going to take over live because of all the sound <laughs> issues. So uh, we apologize for that. And I apologize for the lack of sound at certain points. Um, I was trying to figure out if I changed certain settings, if it would improve, but clearly it did not. So thank you, Petra. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Stacey. And all for going on this technological roller coaster. I'm <laughs> I always have such high hopes and you just never know till you know and now we know and yeah the link to that entire recording I will send to everybody in the follow-up email so you'll have perfect access to that and in the meantime I have all the notes, just the framework of what I went through to make the recording. So I'm just gonna talk through it. I won't have all of the fun props that I brought in and we 
fast forward to um, the seed cleaning demo at the end, or we can just, you know, have leave that as the tantalizing cliffhanger for you to go watch the web itself, because there's a very fun demonstration at the end. But in the meantime, let me just dive right in. So I can't wait to actually share with you the fullness of that Small Farmer's Journal article because it's pretty lovely. Am I the most audaciously <laughs> self-aggrandizing person on the planet? But I look forward to <laughs> sharing those words with you. And then next, I'm going to share kind of seed saving versus seed selecting, one of my very favorite subjects. And then we're going to go through the key questions to ask yourselves. If you're thinking of saving seeds, those are the key questions that you'll need to run through just to make sure you're kind of, you know, connecting all the dots. Then we'll go through the 10 easiest seeds to save. And many of them you can even save this season, even if you didn't plant your garden thinking, I'm going to save seeds this season. So yes, there's so many seeds you can probably still yet save. And then I'll talk of, I'll describe the seed cleaning just a little bit since I don't have my fun props. Um, we'll go through some of the theories really quickly um, and talk about you know seed storage as well. Um, and then, yeah, I want to just share a couple of the common mistakes that are so commonly made. So without further ado, let's unpack each of those things. So there's seed saving and there's seed selecting. Petra? I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, jump sorry. right in. Before Petra gets into all of that, in case you're watching and you're seeing a screen full of people, I just want to remind you that if you go to the upper right hand corner and you'll see three little dots and you click on them, you can pin Petra, which will make her the most prominent one on the screen, which probably would, I would guess would be helpful going forward. Oh, thank you, Stacy. Kind of not paying attention to the chat anymore. Stacy, don't hesitate if there's something that you'd love to jump in. Just raise a finger, and I will be right. I will be right with you. And if um, anybody has a really big question and they put it in the chat, eventually Petro will pause <laughs> and say, "Are there any questions?" and I can read those out. <laughs> Perfect, and don't be shy. I'm woefully capable of monologues and it's much more fun as a dialogue. <laughs> so yes, seed saving versus seed selecting. If you're saving all of the seeds, then you're saving the seeds of the cilantro that bolts first and you're saving the seeds of the less productive varieties and maybe the less delicious varieties. And, and there is some merit to that, without question. Diversity is the foundation of resilience on this planet. That being said, I think of seed saving, and not as seed saving, but as seed selecting. And for example, with fruition seeds, we're selecting for flavor first and foremost, because it kind of doesn't matter otherwise. And also for early maturity. You know, if a tomato isn't going to ripen <laughs> kind of by the middle of August for us here in zone five, it just isn't, it isn't a seed that I want to share with people that I love also in, gross, in short seasons. And then the opposite of that, you know, I want to be saving the seed of the lettuce that bolts last, of the cilantro that bolts last, right? How many of you have lettuce that bolts too soon and cilantro that you wish it didn't bolt so fast? And I, brought, I do have some dill, some dill that goes to seed just a little quicker than you would love. And it's one of the most common mistakes people make is actually saving the seed of those dill, cilantro, lettuce plants that go to seed first rather than last. And so unwittingly, you're selecting for a cilantro that more and more quickly goes to seed. And you'll see really quickly that they just bolt quicker and quicker. And of course, the opposite is true. If you're selecting for later bolting, you'll see that, that all, you'll have a greater extended window of edible cilantro in very short, like two or three years, you can make a very significant difference. And I also wanna lift up that no one is going to do this work if you are not. I mean, yes, here we are at Fruition Seeds and we're doing this work. That being said, when we grow cilantro, the first 20% that bolts, we send it to our neighbor's chickens and, <laughs> and that's great. But if you're saving it yourself, you can select and you can even eat that first 80%. 
that first 95% that bowl. And keep in mind too, and here's a fun little like meta backup to kind of meta vision backup to our industrial food system, stepping straight into 2020, seed growers are not being paid for the quality of their seed. They're being quite paid by the quantity of their seed. So there's no incentive for seed growers unless you're fruition seeds and trying to do things a little bit differently, <laughs> there's no incentive for them to rogue out those plants. And by rogue, I mean to literally take that first blossoming cilantro and bring it to your neighbor's chickens to remove those genetics from the gene pool. And so without that, without that economic incentive there, they're just getting paid by volume and they want to eat just like the rest of us. And so fast forward the last century, we've just really degraded our seed system profoundly as much as we've made huge leaps and bounds in other ways, work that no seed company is going to do. And so that is work that you can do and it'll make a really big difference. So yes, seed selecting and versus seed saving. So the classic examples are just, you know, saving the very first tomatoes that come on in your garden and then saving the last lettuce, the last cilantro, the last arugula to go to seed. And so here, let's dig into, oh, Stacy, yeah. There is a question in the chat room about tomatoes. Um, how does it work with tomatoes on the same plant? Ones that come early versus later. Do they take on the qualities of their mother fruit or the plant itself? So think of, think of them all as like brothers and sisters. You have both genes from, you know, the mother, half of the genetics are coming from that mother that the tomato is on. And then the other half, who knows? Tomatoes, as we'll talk about in a minute, what self versus cross-pollinated means. Tomatoes are self-pollinated. So it could be just that entire genome split in half and then recombined. Or it could be the genome of a 50% of the genetics could come from another male flower, another flower from another plant in, that, in your garden. Um, so it's really hard to say, but I do know that this is true. Even if you have one tomato plant, if you consistently are saving that first tomato that, ripes, that ripens every year, you're actively selecting for earlier and earlier fruit every year. Select the very last tomato. If you save the seed of the very have just before frost then you're actively selecting for a later maturing. And it's subtle, it's bigger, if it's a bigger difference. If you know one plant is way earlier than another, that make a much bigger difference in the ultimate selections. Um, yeah, so excellent question. There's always a benefit to that earlier fruiting, earliest fruits on the earliest fruiting plants as a whole. So here we are the first week of September, it's, by no means the selection for the earliest fruit, but don't think twice. It's still the perfect amount of time to be saving seed. And especially given who knows what's going to be happening this next growing season, I think they're going to see another seed shortage without question. And so the more seeds that you save, and I share this in my in the webinar that was already recorded too, because yes, be, you can be motivated by that scarcity of Oh my gosh, there might not be seeds. I better save seeds. Ah and that is totally valid. I would also like to offer you a contrasting sentiment that a saving seed for joy and for the abundance and for that knowledge that you are doing one of the most fundamentally radical, amazing, positive things on the planet right now, and that you can even save and share those seeds, be fed, feed that good wolf, right? Feed, you be fed by that joyous abundance. Um, even as you hold simultaneously that paradoxical fear of, oh my goodness, what's going to happen next? Maybe there's going to be another seed storage. I better save seeds. So... <laughs> <laughs> so yes, don't let, don't let yourself stop yourself from saving seeds this season is <laughs> really all that I want. Um, oh, and a fun question, Pallavi, can you save seeds from something that's, or something that started rotting? 
Probably when it comes to a tomato, tomatoes don't love to live in the fridge first and foremost. Um, but as long as it's a ripe fruit in the tomato and a ripe tomato, there's going to be ripe seeds in it. Um, and if that's probably still fine. Honestly, a lot of seed companies and seed growers, you would not eat the seeds, eat the fruit of the seeds that they're saving. They have. <laughs> <laughs> so don't let that daunt you in the in the tomato department. Um, so any other questions on that saving selecting front before we dive into the key questions to ask about seed saving? Um, Anne has a question about um, for cool season crops to be harvested near the end of the fall, when is the best time to collect seeds? Mm, when the seed is ripe. <laughs> and so it's very much a case by case basis, Anne and friends. So depending on what that cool season crop is, um, it's more about when the fruit, when the pod, when that seed is right, uh, is ripe, is when is the perfect time. So it's very much a case by case basis, crop by crop, variety by variety. Um, so maybe I'll dive into the key questions to ask because that might help some of the like core questions that we're diving into. And then we will talk about the easiest seeds to save, which we can include some of those and I'm sure some of those crops will come up in um, the fall, what you can be seed saving this fall for cool season crops too. So I'll run through the laundry list of the key questions to ask yourselves. And then I'll, be, I'll unpack each and every one. So from the top, open pollinated, is this variety open pollinated or an F1 hybrid? Number two, is it an annual, biennial, or perennial? Number three, is it self-pollinated or cross-pollinated? Number four, is it wet or dry seeded? Number five, what's its genus species? Let's get dorky with the Latin. And number six, let's talk about ice population size. So I'll go ahead and unpack each of those right now as briefly and as cogently as I am possibly capable. So open pollinated varieties versus F1 hybrid. That's your first question. Because open pollinated varieties will grow true to type, F1 hybrids will not. So I have open pollinated varieties are those that open pollination simply means that you can save its seed and those seeds will grow true to type. They will look basically exactly like its parent. So this lovely little brulee squash, which is a super small, super sweet, really well storing butternut. It's kind of the like, better storing um, alternative to honey nut. We're about to share it this year and we're about to save its seed. I'm so excited to save it with you. So brulee is, an F, is not a hybrid, an F1 hybrid. It's open pollinated. So that means I can take the seed from this squash and it will look basically exactly the same when it grows out. So under, so if open pollinated varieties are a big umbrella, underneath as a smaller umbrella are heirlooms. So heirlooms are simply open pollinated varieties that grow true to type that have been saved more than 50 years. That's kind of the most like technical dry stale Often, of course, there's stories and places and like culture involved as well. And here's the key that I would love to share with you about heirlooms briefly. Heirlooms are history and history happened, but history is also happening now because we're figuring out Zoom <laughs> and how to off so we can actually just have a real conversation with better sound that we're making history right now friends so yes heirlooms happened they were a brand new variety there 300 years ago no one had ever heard of brandy wine tomatoes and now we can't imagine summer without brandy wine tomatoes like my grandfather's ch chestnut chest of drawers didn't always exist he made it and now it's a treasured family heirloom and so think of heirlooms in that light as well. So yes, they happened and they're very special, but think of them too as history that's happening. And so in the same way that new poems, new songs, if we cease to stop write books in our world and our culture, our culture ceases to exist. So think of vegetables in that same light. Um, 
But yeah, Stacy, jump right in. So there's this question from Tracy about, um, she read that heirloom tomato seeds were best because they haven't been modified to look all perfect and round, et cetera. Is this true? Well, it's true that heirlooms haven't been selected for all of the classic kind of industrial model traits. The flavor of modern varieties can be awesome. It just usually isn't because that's not what they're being selected for. Modern varieties, more modern varieties can also be very uniform and you know not crack extensively like heirlooms often do. So it's not fair to say that a modern um, variety is going to not be as flavorful. Um, but it is fair to say that if it's an F1 hybrid, it probably is unless it's a very special hybrid. So for example, honestly, Fruition offers two hybrid tomatoes that are delicious and super disease resistant. So it's literally taking one of Cornell's super disease resistant parent lines and crossing it with brandy wine, <laughs> the heirloom. And so that's why we call it brandy wise because it's the flavor, so much of the flavor of the heirloom with all that disease resistance that like basically doesn't exist <laughs> anywhere else in the world. <laughs> There's very few heirlooms, or pardon me, very few hybrids that have actually been curated with that kind of imagination. Um, so, but yes, as a general rule, if you're interested in flavor, go for the heirlooms. And also if you're interested in flavor at the risk of being a ridiculously shameless plug, um, all of our varieties are delicious or else we don't share them. <laughs> so, and the brulee is an open pollinated variety and it's about four years old. So it's about 46 years old from away, 46 years away from being an heirloom variety. So that's why Ken Green was the first person of the Hudson Valley Seed Company, dear friend and amazing mentor. I first heard say and use the phrase heirlooms of tomorrow. So yes, fruition and we share the seeds of bona fide heirlooms <laughs> that have been around for hundreds of years often. But we also are creating the heirlooms of tomorrow, brand new varieties that no one has ever heard of. You probably haven't heard of brulee, but now you have. And by the time our great, great, great grandchildren are here, this brulee will be a beloved heirloom variety for them that will be long past that, that 50 year threshold, right? So, so that's a little tiny bit of insight into the world of open pollinated versus F1 hybrids. And you can totally save the seed of F1 hybrids. They just aren't going to grow true to type. They're gonna, the pair, if this was an F1 hybrid, it could be big and it could be even smaller and it could be different colors and lots of it, just all of that backlog of genetic diversity, all of those recessive, recessive traits that are being masked in that F1 generation are going to come out in that F2, that second filial generation. So you can totally save seeds from hybrids. They just don't grow true to type, which is awesome for the plant breeders of the world, which as we just talked about with the Small Farmers Journal article, we're all plant breeders now. <laughs> but that being said, sometimes you want to save a seed and be confident that it's going to grow type. <laughs> and it's not too much to ask. And so in which case, heirlooms and open pollinate var varieties are the ones to choose. And Stacy, I saw your hand up. Um, we have hit a vein with, with tomatoes. <laughs> so Michael would like to know, is it better to let the tomato ripen on the vine or off the vine? Yeah, it's better to ripen on the vine because the tomato is green. That tomato is actively photosynthesizing and tomatoes create 20% of their own sugars in house, in situ, in the, in the tomato itself. So if you're not letting it ripen on the vine, then there's right off the top, 20% of its flavor isn't going to be there. So yes, it's definitely worth letting them ripen on the vine. And certainly if you're saving seeds, you want it to that the ripest, densest, most mature, most vigorous seed will be in that ripest tomato. And the next tomato question is, does it make sense to save seeds from early and late maturing tomatoes so that you have tomatoes over a longer time? That is a wonderful question and it's counterintuitive, but if you're selecting for earlier tomatoes, 
and it's an indeterminate variety, you're actually selecting for more fruit over time. You're not selecting for late, you are selecting for late season um, when you're selecting the later season seeds, but that is not at all going to, you're not actively, you're not actually amplifying your abundance throughout the to be intentionally going early and late. Just harvest from the early fruits and that way they'll be from, especially if they're indeterminate varieties, then they'll be producing all the more throughout. And I wonder if we wanna save any more tomato questions for like tomato is on my list of the easiest seeds to save. So I wanna be sure that we get through um, kind of these other like foundational, kind of the biology um, before we jump into the nitty gritty seeds. Does yeah. that make sense? I think we'll save all the questions until maybe the end because they're really accumulating. <laughs> oh, so fun. And yeah, if there's ones around um, specific crops that I'll talk about later, we can lift those up too. Um, and I think I'm going to turn on the light because I see it's quite dark. Dun, dun, dun. So yes, so that was open pollinated versus F1 hybrids. So next, let's talk about annuals versus biennials versus perennials. And I think most of you probably have a good sense of this, so I won't go into great detail. But annuals are those that produce seeds in one season. And sometimes you don't even think about it, but you have this intrinsic internal knowledge that that's happening. For example, you plant a watermelon seed in the, the, after last frost, and then you're spitting to watermelon seeds at your sister <laughs> three months, two months later. So you ha even if you aren't thinking, wow, I've just witnessed the entirety of this plant's life cycle. You've witnessed the entirety of this plant's life cycle. So if you can imagine where the seed is inside, it's probably an annual. Um, biennials are crops like tomato, oh, pardon me, carrots, beets, onions, cabbage. Basically, if you're like, where is a, the seed of this? And it's a root vegetable, like it's probably a biennial. And then taking two growing seasons to mature its seed, it needs that fertilization, that wintering period to then kind of transition its enzymes and go to seed in that second season. And then, of course, are just around from year to year and they're producing seeds every year as well. So it's just the why easiest to save seeds from annuals and also perennials. Um, biennials are pretty tricky, especially here in zone five in our short seasons because for them, somehow we have a very climate controlled root cellar and it can be challenging at a home scale. So now let's talk self versus cross pollinated. So self pollinated flowers, those where the flowers can actually fertilize themselves. And then cross-pollinated varieties are those where the flowers, the plants cannot pollinate themselves. And an important facet here is that not every variety, don't think of it as a switch, as a binary. We have too many false binaries in the world, and this is one of them. But it's a spectrum. Of, and over here on the far end of the profoundly self-pollinated varieties are peas, beans, peas. These actually, their flowers literally open after they have pollinated themselves. So it doesn't matter, pretend these are two beans, six, two bean flowers on two different beans plants, six inches away from each other, they would not cross. Even if the, the flowers are adjacent to each other, they won't cross because they pollinated before the flower even opened. So those are very easy to save seed of because you know that they're going to grow true to type. You didn't have to worry about them crossing. So cross-pollinated varieties. And so there's a spe on the spectrum, tomatoes, it's nice to have 10 feet in between plants. We'll talk more about isolation distance in a few minutes. Um, but something like peppers, also self-pollinated, more like 80 feet between plants to keep those distinct varieties distinct and not crossing. Like squash is, crosses up to a mile. Corn is profoundly cross-pollinated. It's been proven to cross over 36 miles. And so, yes, knowing whether things are, plants are self or cross-pollinated also just helps you make decisions of, around 
you know, maybe this is easier to save. Maybe it's not easy to save. Self-pollinated varieties are much easier to save and grow true to type, um, not get contaminated with other varieties compared to cross-pollinated varieties. And next we have wet versus dry seeds. And of course the wet seeds are instead inside a wet fleshy fruit. And the dry seeds, just like this beautiful dill, are those that are exposed to the elements. And what makes that very important right here in our climate is that what we have, so back it up, Petra, where are you? I'm in the Finger Lakes of Western New York and we're in zone five and it rains, albeit it was one of the driest seasons on record in our county, but it still rains consistently. And even if it doesn't physically rain, there's often dew on the plants in the morning. When I lived for many years in Oregon, it didn't literally, did, it was very arid, more Mediterranean. It didn't rain from the beginning, middle of June till the end of September did not rain, like no humidity, so no, no dew on the plants in the morning. And so there's a lot, water is the primary vector for every disease on the planet. And so it's key if you live in a humid climate where there's rain, when you have these dry seeded crops, it's vital that you be harvesting them as soon as they're ripe. That necessity isn't there with the wet seeded crops. They're just hanging out in a wet environment anyway. But as soon as your green dry seeded seeds turn to gold and release from their seed heads, you need to harvest them right away for the highest quality seed. So, so dry and wet seeded crops, both honestly equally easy to save. Just super important to know that if it's a dry seeded crop that you need to be on top of when you're harvesting them so that you have the highest quality seed. Next, let's talk about genus and species. So Canis lupus, dogs. It still blows my mind that <laughs> a greyhound and a chihuahua could make babies if they wanted to. <laughs> and there are some phenomenal equivalents in your vegetable garden. <laughs> so for example, Cucurbita pipo, genus species. Let's get dorky right into your Latin binomials. So the genus Cucurbita and the species pipo. That is zucchini, also summer squash, patty pan squash. Oh wait, but it's also acorn and delicata and spaghetti squash. Aha! <laughs> and I didn't even list them all. Pumpkins. I mean, it, it's a lot of things that cross, again, because they're cross-pollinated, up to one mile. So it's really important to know that genus species. So you know, wait, if I'm growing zucchini and pumpkin all in the same garden, the, the chances of them crossing are actually quite high. So if it's a single, and you'll see on the back, it's, you'll find the genus species right under there's the variety name, Caribe cilantro, and then you'll find the genus species, Andrum sativum. Mmm, delicious. So yes, you'll see all the genus species, and you'll find that on our website as well, under every single variety at the bottom. So yes, that's where knowing genus species makes all the difference. So then I can't tell you how many people send me pictures every year of zucchini pumpkins, and they're like, it's almost like my zucchini and my pumpkin crossed last year, and I'm like, Yes, it is just like that. <laughs> and now you know why. So when you're thinking of questions to ask yourself around which seeds you're going to save, that Latin is very critical to know. And our final little facet of the questions to ask yourselves, yourselves before you are really saving seeds and digging in is this. Let's talk about isolation distance as well as population size. So I mentioned isolation distance earlier, um, where tomatoes, for example, need really ideally 10 feet between distinct varieties for those seeds to be fully self-pollinated and be remaining distinct varieties grown true to type without crossing with each other. With peppers, they're also self-pollinated, but farther along, more toward the cross-pollinated spectrum. They're 80 feet between varieties, but honestly, heat, the heat gene is totally dominant. And so 
<laughs> we do 300 feet on our farm just to keep them totally separate with confidence. Um, with zucchini, pumpkins, it's honestly a mile. Um, and that's why Fruition has five different farms. <laughs> <laughs> so that we can keep, you know, all our cucumbers would cross with all of our other cucumbers. You can also isolate in time as well as distance. And that's really important with something like corn, for example, because corn will cross up to 36 miles, um, just over 36 miles. And there's so much genetically modified corn all around us here in the Northeast and all across, honestly, our planet. And so the nice thing is I can call up John, uh, my friend who had, who grows thousands of acres of GM corn in our valley. And I went to school with his kids and I'll say, John, when's your corn going to tassel this year? And he says, oh, it's going to tassel about July 15. And I say, thanks, John. <laughs> I love John a lot. And he, I've learned a lot from him. Um, and I love that he can tell me exactly when his GM corn is going to tassel. So then I can be very careful <laughs> and plant our corn <laughs> so that it will be tasseling at different times. Because just like if these were two beans, because beans pollinate before they even flower, <laughs> they can literally be right next to each other and they won't cross. And so corn in that same light, if this corn is one foot away from this corn and this genetically modified corn is tasseling, sending out its pollen three weeks earlier than my open pollinated heirloom corn is, is sending out its um, tassels on its ears, or pardon me, the silks on its ears, then they just don't cross. The pollen might fall on the plant, but it's not going to fertilize the plant. So that's a fun little thought. And then population size, because plants experience inbreeding depression, just like any other living thing on the planet. Humans can experience inbreeding depression. It's not pretty. And it's the same is true for um, plants that you save seeds of. So, but basically anything, the only keys to keep in mind, you want to 200 plants with corn, with beets, with onions, and with carrots. A those, you can get away with way less plants. And even honestly, just fruit from one tomato is fine. One bean is fine. One pea is fine. Even one pepper is okay. Even one, honestly, zucchini, even though they're cross-pollinated, they have been bottlenecked many times in their genetic history. And so they don't mind it where corn does. So just a few really fun things to keep in mind. So I'll run through that laundry list of key questions again um, that you can ask yourself. Open pollinated versus F1 hybrid, knowing right from the top if which of those are. Next, annual, biennial, perennial, knowing which that is. And knowing if the plant, if a plant is self or cross pollinated, if it's wet or dry seeded, and knowing its genus species goes a long way. And all of those clues will give you a sense of isolation distance as well as population size. And if you don't already know, if you haven't seen on our website at fruitionseeds.com, you'll find every variety with all of our varieties. We have seed saving info for all of those varieties as well. So that's a fun little thing to keep in mind. So let's, from here on, um, I will dive into the easiest seeds to save. Um, and Stacy, I don't know if there are any, any questions you saw around kind of those questions that you want to lift up before we do the 10 easiest seeds to save. Um, okay. Also try Stacy Bell's. I think it kind of relates. Does that squash have the male and female flower on the same plant like the zucchini as my instructor at the U of M says if you save the seeds from it there's no telling what I'm going to get. I'm confused. Oh, yes. Squash and all cucurbits, so squash, cucumbers, watermelons, cantaloupe, all that whole family has on one single plant they'll have male and female flowers and within each of those, but that plant can fertilize itself without question. So it's more about, yes, it like there'll be male and female flowers. But the thing to keep in mind if you is, are you growing multiple things with the same genus species slash who of your neighbors is? And that's often what can, um, what makes zucchini being saved 
urban and especially suburban environments tricky because if lots of people are growing lots of different zucchinis and summer squash and pumpkins and delicata squash all of those crops are all cucurbita pipo so that's where the cross that's where the crossing can come in um, she also asks, if you save seeds from perennials, what do you do? Leave half, leave half, will the plant come back if I'm seed saving? Yeah, so the, the idea with perennials is they're just set up biologically across countless millennia and millions of years to be taking care of themselves and then just sending lots of seeds out every year. So you don't have to worry about the plant's longevity when you're taking seeds from it. Um, great question. Another question, Janelle asks, in a suburban or urban environment, can you reasonably save seeds if your neighbors are growing similar crops? Yeah, that's where, that's a wonderful question. And that's honestly where knowing, knowing your neighbors and what they're growing makes all the difference. You can also actually record a webinar through the NOFA Mass website. Um, and you'll find the link on our website soon about how to hand pollinate squash. Because regardless of what other cucurbits, what other squash, zucchinis, pumpkins, um, your neighbors are growing, you can just do some hand pollinations yourselves and it's super fun and it's super easy. And then you can be really confident that you're saving seeds that are gonna go true to type. Um, but yeah, that's always, you know, with sunflowers too, we'll talk about um, and yeah, those will all cross pollinate too. So knowing what your neighbors are growing is definitely another reason why I'm really grateful that fruition seeds is down in the hills in the middle of a relative nowhere. <laughs> so <laughs> we have lots of forests <laughs> and and our neighbors, our one neighbor doesn't mind if we're just like, oh, you want to grow zucchini? Here's the zucchini we're growing. Here you go. So they're literally growing the same exact zucchini that we grow every given, any given year and the same sunflowers. <laughs> um, I got another one from Emily Young, who's wondering if my sweet corn cross pollinates with my, with the nearby farms cow corn, will it affect this year's corn or only if I save those seeds, would mm. they be affected a subsequent year? Oh, yes, wonderful question. So as a general rule, if, so this is cucurbita machata, this brulee, and if on um, Long Island cheese pumpkin and honey nut, also to phenomenal, and our gouda, for all phenomenal cucurbita machatas. So if I'm growing them in proximity, they could cross. I wouldn't be able to tell. This brulee, if it was crossed up, it would just still look exactly like this. The only exception to that is corn. Everything else is going to look just, you would never know, but corn, you can. And it looks like this. And you only can tell in certain kernels because fun fact, all of those silks on your corn, each of those silks correspond to a single kernel inside the ear. And so a pollen grain literally lands, has to land at the end of that pollen, of that silk, and it travels all the way up that silk until it attaches to the ear, and then it forms a kernel when it fertilizes. Crazy. So if it is a sweet corn, it will, that if you, and you're letting it, you won't see it right away if you're eating it in the sweet corn stage. When you would see it is if you're saving seed and the seeds of sweet corn, perhaps you've seen them, they're quite shriveled and shrunken. They don't have as much of the carbohydrates and those soluble starches um, that you'll find in flour, flint, dent, popcorns. And so the, the sweet corn will like look all little and shriveled, but if you see a great big full kernel, You've got GMO field corn. And if you also have colored corn, for example, like any number of different varieties, like our glass gem um, or anything that's colored, and then you see a big yellow ear in that, um, or pardon me, a big yellow kernel in that, then you're like, Ugh, that's it. And so, you know, but the good news is you can see the kernels that cross and you can physically remove them. The GM traits, the genetically modified traits are in incredibly dominant. And so the good news about that is that you can select against that. Um, 
as you, when you're saving seed, which is a whole other for <laughs> the rest of our lives. <laughs> Um, one final question, I think. Christy Hillenbrand wonders if you would need to hand pollinate the open pollinated varieties as well. Yes, if they are going to cross. So yeah, if this group open pollinated variety is growing five feet away from another open pollinated heirloom like Long Island cheese pumpkins, they're going to cross. So it's more about at that point, the genus than about the open pollinated versus hybrid? Awesome question, my friend. <laughs> um, well, awesome, maybe I'll jump into the 10 easiest seeds to save and I'll just run pretty quickly. Um, and certainly if anyone has any questions, we'll stop at the end for a moment of each of those varieties too. Um, so let's dive into the first the three. I'll kind of go through all at once peas and beans and also peanuts because you know they are so easy to save as i mentioned earlier they're profoundly self-pollinated to the extent that they literally pollinate before the flower even opens and so you can be really you don't have to worry about them crossing with your neighbor at all um so the hard thing is you have to choose between your cake and eating it, which is not the case in something like brulee, right? That's one of the, or a tomato or a watermelon. But in the case of this bean, I had to choose, I love, this is the Scarlet Runner bean, which is one of the first beans that I ever saved in my life, um, way back in my father's garden 30 years ago. And so this bean, I had to not eat it at the green delicious stage and it's gone through its shelling stage and now it's turned gold. And once it's gold, then the dry seeds inside are good to go. So that's the hardest part with beans, peas. You just can't eat <laughs> the beans and eat the peas in their green delicious stage. And you wanna wait until these pods are nice and green. And you can see this one, I wanted to show you specifically because it's gold down here, but look, it's pretty dark and dingy up here. That's what happens if you don't harvest it right away in this hot, in this humid climate. So it's already starting to rot. Um, and luckily I caught it in plenty of time. Like take a look at the inside, that silvery, beautiful inner life of this bean pod is bright. If it's still bright white, that means the seeds are just fine. If it was getting dark inside, that the seed quality was dramatically diminishing. Um, and you can see sometimes the seeds themselves will start to rot and mold, um, in which case just don't even try to save them. Um, and you want to be waiting until that seed inside, if I press my fingernail into it, that it is nice and solid. It's a tiny little rock. And so that's another clue. So yes, that's how, and so saving beans and peas super easy. Peanuts, really similar. They pollinate in the same style before the flower even opens, but they're a little different, right? They send their peduncles, their, their purple ones, a flower flowers <laughs> above a seed stalk on the, on the stalk of the plant. They'll send down this purple peduncle into the ground and that will form the peanuts in the ground. And you want to just let them do that all summer long and all fall until it frosts immediately lift them up with digging with a digging fork so you can see like you're pulling up this plant and there's all these dangling peanuts it's amazing i've been doing this for years and i still feel like i'm five every time it's the best so and so those peas peanuts you want to save you know the biggest peanuts some of them will have four or even five peanuts in a shell. Some of them will have two. Some will have one. You want to save the seeds for the next generation that have the most pe peanuts in each peanut shell. Um, and yeah, and so that, those are some fun little tips on peas and beans as well as peanuts. Super easy to save because they're self-pollinated and they're dry seeded um, and they're you know, annuals, so really easy to save and you don't have to think too much about the, at all about the isolation distance. 
also super easy to save are dill and cilantro. So cilantro, dill, again, you want to make sure that you're saving, not just saving those seeds, but selecting those seeds so that you're actively selecting for seeds that are going to be more edible <laughs> for more time. Um, if you're anything like me and you're growing dill and cilantro because you want to eat it. <laughs> and so the key here is that just like with this dill, this was a beautiful, I mean, just, I can't, I'm sure how many of you can imagine and have seen a dill flower this year, right? That big, beautiful yellow umbel and the dill pollen is actually delicious. If you don't already eat your dill pollen, do it. Sprinkle it on eggs. It's incredible. Um, and, but if you don't, <laughs> um, if you don't let that, if you let them just stay, those green seeds will turn gold and it's so important that you harvest them right away as soon as they're gold um, so that none of that moisture will have time to turn because just in the same way that that bean pod will turn from gold to kind of brown that will happen with these gold seeds as well so it's super critical that you harvest them as early as you possibly can of course on a dry day i had that will be the best. Um, and then arugula I wanted to mention too because arugula is so easy to save the seeds of. And again, arugula bolts so quickly, right? It goes to seed really quickly. It sends up that seed stalk and then it gets more bitter. And the good news then, it makes seed. So save the arugula that goes to seed last and you'll want those green pot, those pods that form will turn from green to gold. And when they turn gold, harvest them. They'll want to shatter the more ripe and mature they get. If you don't get it right on time, they'll actually dehiss is the fun word and spread those seeds prematurely. Um, well, prematurely only by our <laughs> standards. And um, so then they'll be, you'll have arugula growing as a volunteer weed in your garden <laughs> rather than seed in your hand that you can specifically plant somewhere in your garden. And in that same spirit, lettuce is so wonderful to save the seed of. And it also is very self-pollinated. I literally have tied lettuce heads of separate varieties flowering together and saved all of those seeds and only a few of them actually crossed. Most of them did not. <laughs> so saving, you don't need to worry about isolation distance or any, any of that population size either with self-pollinated lettuce. And you'll see, I'm about to do a little, um, live video about this, but lettuce seed, it's very closely related to dandelion. Um, and so the flowers are bright yellow and they turn into those little fluffy orbs, just like dandelions do, distribute themselves along the wind, um, just like dandelions do. And so you simply go and when you see that fluffy ball emerge, just go and pluck each of those little fluffy orbs and put them into, you know, oh, we'll talk about seed storage in a few minutes. Um, but yes, lettuce, just make sure that you're again selecting rather than just saving seeds, select for the lettuce that will bolt and go to seed later than any of the other variety, any of the other lettuce. Um, and then now let's talk about flowers. Because so many flowers are very easy to save. Flowers, albeit cross-pollinate readily. And so if you're growing, that's where the genus species comes in so handy. If you're saving cosmos, for example, and they're the same genus species um, and different varieties, they'll readily cross. There are multiple varieties, multiple species rather, of cosmos. So keep that in mind. That's a fun little fact. Um, but cosmos, super easy. Zinnia is also really easy. You just want to make sure that, again, like the, that the, um, the cosmos will look actually pretty similar to this dill where they're on an umbel and just kind of this splayed out firework of all of these just singular exposed seeds splayed out on your seed head where something like a zinnia is a little more tricky because the seeds are buried in this seed head and they're still attached to this petal that's dry. You want to wait for the stem to turn nice and brown and you can like pull out those petals and see that there's the like kind of arrowhead shaped seed at the base and 
honestly, if you want to just save it like that, great. Just make sure it's super dry. We'll talk about the drying and seed cleaning in a few minutes, but you can also just gently go like this and that those petals will release effortless, effortlessly from ripe, mature zinnia seeds. Um, I did want to mention with your sunflowers, friends, just a quick little note on the sunflower weevil, oof, which is very devastating because this sunflower weevil is honestly just brilliant. And what happens is this. Imagine this little lovely brulee squash is a sunflower <laughs> and just a fresh, like here's the petals, just like the seed hasn't formed yet. It's still flowering like mad. And that sunflower weevil will come and lay her eggs right in that kind of primordial ovary, the primordial seed that hasn't even formed yet. And so the seed, amazingly, will form its seed coat and mature its seed with that egg integrated into the meat and heart of that sunflower seed. Isn't that amazing? So it literally encapsulates it's just a brilliant thing. I'm just blown away by the genius of insects and of life on earth. Um, but the sunflower weevil is just brilliant. But the devastating part is that the sunflower weevil, at some point over the winter generally, and then spring too, that sunflower weevil egg will hatch. And then that larva will proceed to sunflower seed. <laughs> and so that's all well and good if you're a sunflower weevil, but that means that you're not going to germinate. <laughs> if you're a seed saver. So the easy way to thwart your sunflower is the sunflower weevil is to harvest your sunflower seeds when the head is nice and brown and dry, the seeds are fully mature, dry them super well so they break rather than bend and then freeze them. And we'll talk about saving seeds, storing seeds in a few minutes, but basically dry them out as crisp as you can and then put in desiccant packets in a plastic bag for three days. And those desiccant packets will wick away any additional, any extra moisture. So those seeds are just bone dry. And we have desiccant packets on our website, great big ones that we use in all our seeds. But you can also, so we'd love to share those, but you can also just use, you know, when you get a new pair of shoes and it has that desiccant packet, that silica gel packet, or like nori for sushi. Sometimes vitamins have them. Totally save them. Put them in your seed collection. It's only really effective if you, it's an airtight environment. So put them in like a closed plastic bag is the easiest root there. But once you are confident that your sunflower seeds are totally dry, then you can put them in the freezer. Be confident that the seeds will be just fine, but the sunflower weevils will die. <laughs> so that's a very critical little uh, trick for saving sunflower seeds. And Stacy, yeah. Um, I kind of feel like this question goes along with the things you've been talking about. So Maria's wondering, um, she wants to save seeds from nettles to grow next spring. Are seeds ready in the green or black stage? And should I plant the seeds this fall or wait until early spring? I would wait until they're black and dark and also hard. So wait until they feel like little solid rocks, but the darker, the better for sure. And then honestly, you can plant them in fall That's when nature plants her seeds, right? But you can also wait till spring and it depends. If you're harvesting tons of seed and then sprinkling it places, that's nature's approach. If you only harvest a few seeds, then I would save them for spring and individually hand plant them because yeah, there's, Otherwise, that shotgun approach is really productive and effective um, for tons of seed to then drop, knowing that not all the seeds are going to take. So there's a few keys to keep in mind. Um, one more question. I'm not sure, to be honest, because I'm not a gardener, but patty pans. Um, when are patty pans ready to harvest for seeds? Ooh, yeah. So they'll basically turn into a great big gourd. <laughs> and here's They'll, and their skin will be really hard. They'll kind of look like a winter squash, gourd of sorts. And you want to wait till the stem is dry, um, dried down. Oh, and I see Judith asked, how long for the sunflower seed? Three days. 
not long. You can just leave them in the freezer if you're keeping seeds in the freezer. We'll talk about seed storage in a few minutes. Um, yeah, three days, it, not long at all to kill that sunflower weevil. Um, so the next variety that's super is tomato. And in the webinar that I'll have uploaded on our website um, right after this that you can watch, I had a whole demonstration of the fermentation process, which is really easy and really fun. And I can't wait to share it all with you. So, but, so I'll send you two places since seeing is believing slash a picture is a thousand words. The video, the demonstration is going to be so much better than me simply describing it to you. So you'll find that demo in two different places. First, we have a whole blog about it. Um, so if you just simply search like Google search fruition seeds blog tomato seeds, that will probably be number one in your search engine. So you'll find that um, whole blog describing with words how to go through the process, but also has a really nice video taking you through the process as well. And then the, the webinar recording um, that we started tonight with um, has a full demonstration of that as well. So, but just know that it's critical to ferment both tomato and cucumber seeds so that you can neutralize all the anti-germination compounds in that gelatinous membrane that you'll find around every single fruit, every single seed. Um, and then the final crop type that I wanted to share that's so easy to save the seed of that I hope that you do, and I didn't even bring any to share, is garlic. So garlic is so easy to save the seeds of. And save the biggest, nicest, only plant the biggest, nicest, ideally organic, um, seed bulbs that you can. And because there's a direct relationship between the size of the bulb and the health of the bulb of those cloves that you plant, and then the size and health of the bulb that you are harvesting next summer. So yes, and we still have some of our awesome varieties left at fruitionseeds.com, as well as your the garlic and shallots. And if you haven't already seen our garlic and shallot um, Academy that is our online course. We just made it free and it has hours and hours of video tutorials break, broken down into season by season and step by step. And yeah, that has tons of great info. So if you're curious how to save um, seed of those and grow everything about them, go ahead and join that online course. It's totally free and kind of awesome. Um, every day now I'm getting emails from people saying, thank you so much. I'm learning so much. This is awesome. So definitely join us. And Stacy, yeah. Um, Fire Tablet has a question about garlic. Um, when is the best time to plant garlic in the Bristol slash Naples area? Yes. So actually some this just in we're refining our approaches to everything constantly but any like kind of late September early October is an ideal time we've traditionally for years have been waiting anytime between Halloween and Thanksgiving is generally what we tell people and actually we're starting we're to change our tune we've been experimenting and also um, seeing our friend John Hunt of Hunt Country Vineyards, he's amazing and he grows tons of garlic and he plants in late September and he just mulches. If you're not going to mulch, it's a lot more dangerous, but if you can put on five, six inches of really good mulch, then you're going to grow the even bigger garlic in terms of just diameter and healthier garlic too if you can plant it at the end of September beginning of October and just mulch it really deeply but I go into that in a lot more detail um, in the garlic and shallot academy which I just noticed that it's 720 so let's save all the garlic and shallot questions for the academy and also honestly Actually, Stacy, you might know the date right off the top of your head. I believe it's next week on Friday. We're going to be doing a whole hour long on growing garlic. So definitely register for that as well. Maybe in, um, in my follow-up email, I'll send the link. And Stacy, maybe she can share yeah, that. I can probably put it in the chat. Yeah. Nice. But yeah, go ahead and register for that so that we can just spend an entire hour just talking about garlic. I can't wait. <laughs> so in the meantime, just know that garlic is one of the easiest seeds to save, even though it's not technically a seed. <laughs> and so from here, um, 
let's talk about saving how to save seeds and store them so you might and i've made a whole little seed save seeds graphic that perhaps you saw it in the video sharing this webinar link i'll also share and the follow-up email. Um, but yeah, basically you wanna keep seeds in cool, dark, dry areas. And so just cut to the quick, your kitchen cupboard is just fine. <laughs> you just wanna make sure that you're drying your seeds fully before putting them into any kind of storage, whether it's your freezer or your kitchen cupboard, because if it's not dry fully, it's going to rot fully <laughs> before long. So the easiest way to dry seeds, don't think temperature. If it's above 95 degrees, I my Polish self agrees, it's just getting really hot. And you can actually kill little tiny lovely seeds above 95 degrees really quickly. So don't be tempted. So many people ask if they can dry seeds in dehydrators. And the answer is yes, just keep it on fan, but don't put it on any kind of temperature. So right, that air wicking the moisture away is the best way. And all of our greenhouses and places where we're drying, we just have fans grow, blowing constantly. So wicking away that moisture constantly. And that is the best way to dry your seeds. And if it's a big enough seed, like this cucumber or a cucumber seed too, but this brulee, this cucurbit seed, this winter squash, imagine a winter squash seed. It's pretty big, right? If you try to break it and it's bending, it's not dry enough. And if you're trying to break it and it breaks, it's dry enough. So that's like eight, 10% moisture. I, we don't even, I mean, at Fruition Seeds, we don't even have equipment to tell us what moisture it is. We just go by the breaking and break rule and also just air on the side of super, super dry. And then you can avoid many of the common, common problems that people will have in just having seed not store well on account of moisture. Um, and yeah, like I mentioned too, those desiccant packets make a really big difference um, in wicking any extra moisture away, just making sure that they are bone dry and for the long haul. Um, yeah, so of course there's a thousand other things to talk about with seed saving friends. Um, and I did wanna share with you too, a couple little things um, in terms of just planning and knowing when you harvested things and keeping track of that. I just wanted to let you know, we made these beautiful little calendars, perhaps you've seen them. They're across the seasons calendar that um, is a perpetual calendar. So it has, you know, dates, but it doesn't have days of the week. So it has one, two, three, four, five, but instead of Monday through Sunday, it has like here we have the year 2000, and then there's another column for 2001, 2002. Of course, you can just write this year and as you love. And then we're saying you know, when, we're, when we're sowing seeds, when we're harvesting seeds, when we're noticing diseases pop up, when we're noticing <gasps> that the flea beetles are back, when we're noticing that the scarlet tanagers have arrived and the cicadas start to sing and all kinds of things we're putting on this, as well as when we start to save seeds. And so that's just really handy. So, that, I mean, it's just interesting, but also then as we fill this in and use it across the seasons, which is why we call it, <laughs> then you'll see those emergent patterns. And um, th there's also this whole little section in the back. Let's dig in. So you can see here's all of your tomato info. Here's all of your garlic info. Here's all of your lettuce info. So it has all of that. Um, and I wanted to share, perhaps you heard about our community art packets back at the beginning of the pandemic when our printer wasn't printing. And we hired to make all kinds of amazing our packets and we are, <laughs> um, our printer, the good news is our printer is printing. So we're everything is in our new, our beautiful packets. But the bad, the sad news is we miss them already on our shelves and sharing them with people. But the good news is we have some extras. And so if you would like them, we just put them on our website. Here's an amazing little watercolor. And I love this little insect print. Um, so yeah, we're, we just put these on our website too. This is kind of my favorite of all time, this Jessica Gath. 
<laughs> bring your ideas to fruition. Oh my gosh. And then on the back tab, it says open up and grow. <laughs> Just amazing. Um, so yes, if you're looking envelopes to share seeds, especially with people you love that are fun and beautiful, you'll find those on our website now as well. Um, and yeah, so I'm um, Stacy, your hand went in the air and don't let me stop you. <laughs> Oh, you're on mute, my friend. Stacy, you are on mute, and I love you. <laughs> wow. Okay, so iPad 3 is dying, just dying to know what is the best way to save cone flowers. Oh, wonderful. Yes, until all of the petals will fall off and that the cone will be very elongated. And honestly, it's gonna be spiky. As it's maturing its seed, it literally, I've like, I wear gloves. I usually don't wear gloves in the garden, but I do with coneflower because it just kind of rips you up. <laughs> Same thing with like, you know, Mexican sunflower. There's just lots of sharp edges. And so when you have those garden gloves on, and another key, just like with this dill, when it's ripe, mature seed, and I just pluck it a little bit, it just falls right off, right? It has no resistance. Once that seed is mature, once your coneflower seed is mature, it will vary, not as easily as dill. Dill will just like explode off. But the coneflower, you can see that that seed will separate really quickly from that inner core of a cone inside. So yes, have fun and maybe I'll make, I'll make a little video about that. That would be really fun. Is it okay to fit in a few questions right now? Yeah, let's do, let's do two. I especially just want to lift up, like I'm here all night, but I, let's just give a little virtual round of applause to Kira and to Max for <laughs> doing all of this ASL translation so that all of us can be a part of the conversation. So Kira and Max, thank you. And let's just share a couple more questions um, in the spirit of giving them a break. And also, you know, you can share, uh, maybe I can take a look at all of these or Facebook can maybe make a CSV of all these questions and send them to me. And I can um, per perhaps create some blog posts around them and find ways to answer them in the future too. I want be, yeah, I'm here to answer your questions. That's why we're here. <laughs> so, but without further ado, let's, um, let's do two more questions and then call it a night. Okay. So Robert Romberg would love to know what is the best time to grow peanuts and do you sell seeds? Yeah. So yes, we sell seeds. Um, our regionally adapted organic seeds, you'll find fruitionseeds.com. And we absolutely have peanuts. And you, the best time to grow them is as soon as you plant your basil, as soon as you plant your tomatoes, when it's past that danger of frost. And we're talking, it's early summer. So for us here in the Finger Lakes, it's really like end of May, even beginning of June when the soil is nice and warm. And peanuts are a full season crop. So it's too late to grow them now, but get them now so that <laughs> you'll have them for next, for next year, for sure. Okay, question number two comes from Pallavi. Um, I'm harvesting a lot of calendula seeds, but while waiting for them to dry on the stock, there have been a couple of rains. Does this affect the seeds adversely? And green seeds, if harvested early, will they still dry out and be viable? Wonderful question, Pallavi, and yes, so, it's not ideal to have just like, I mean, imagine this bean pod that is kind of golden down here, but it's starting to get pretty brown and oh, some black spots too. So I imagine that's kind of what your calendula looks like. And it's ideal to harvest it with when it's totally gold. That's the highest quality seed. It will last the longest into the future. It will have the greatest vigor when it germinates. But honestly, if it's rained a couple times, if it's just starting to tinge, 
you can still harvest it. It's less quality seed, but especially if you're just planning on saving it, sowing it next year, go ahead and save it. Just make sure that you dry it down as quickly as you possibly can. And yeah, actually, I'm glad that you mentioned that, Pallavi, because I wanted to show you all too. We're just starting things and check it out. So we made one for calendula first and foremost, and um, they're beautiful PDFs. I I'll, Maybe I'll try to remind myself and remember to attach this in um, the replay email too. So check it out. It's um, calendula and it's how to grow it. All kinds of details, top, lots of great info, um, just like the at a glance info, but then different types of calendula and then how to sew it and then how to um, cultivate it, how to harvest it, how to make medicine of it, and then this whole section on seed saving as well. And then other links to our blog. So it's, we're going to be making these over the next few months for every single one of our crop types so that you can, you know, be surrounded by all of that abundance right at arm's length, one stop shop style. So Yes, um, check it out and stay tuned for more, more of them. And your second question, I forget, what was it? What was the part two of Lobby's question? Um, hold on, I scrolled past it. I gotta find it again. It oh. is, and green seeds, if harvested early, will they still dry out and be viable? Not very likely. Certainly they won't have the vigor, so I highly recommend you not is the short answer. <laughs> well, friends, this has been so delightful. I'm so honored. It sends shivers down my spine that I'm not the only person that cares about seeds, that I'm not the only person that cares about seed saving. <laughs> and I have asked so many questions of so many people, friends, and I continue, honestly, today, I was on the phone with three different mentors at three different points in time, asking them all different questions. <laughs> so never hesitate to reach out and ask questions of us. And I highly recommend, in full disclosure, I'm rather terrible at responding promptly to my emails. I always endeavor to do better, but send emails to heather at fruitionseeds.com. She is our community connections coordinator. She is, and honestly, she knows so much. Don't feel like you are getting secondhand information <laughs> or subpar information from Heather. She is an unbelievable font of knowledge. So go ahead. And if she doesn't know, she just sends them. She asked me. So go ahead and send any of your Heather at fruitionseeds.com. And if you don't already hang out with us on Instagram, on Facebook, we're always sharing things there. And you know, we send out weekly emails as well. So stay tuned. And you know, just don't forget that each of you have as much capacity to change the world as every single one of these seeds. And the final sentiment I want to leave you with is this. This one single seed, I'm going to pluck it out of the bean shell. This one single seed, I can plant it next year maybe at the end of May. And I'm going to harvest hundreds of seeds from this one single seed. I might even harvest thousands. In the case of lettuce, I, we often harvest 10, 12, 15,000 seeds from one single lettuce plant. <laughs> In the case of amaranth and quinoa, it can be upwards of 30,000 seeds from one plant, from one seed and one the thing that can turn into 10,000 more things. And each of those 10,000 things can be 10,000 more things. I'm not good at math, but who am I not to have hope for this world? And I'm like kind of crying right now, to be honest with you. It's a terrifying time to be <laughs> alive on this planet, on this continent, caring about our species but suddenly saving seeds and sharing these seeds, I am totally crying, <laughs> is honestly one of the most radical things that you can be doing to give yourself confidence that you matter, 
and that you are making choices that matter and that you are saving the world and saving these seeds and saving yourself and saving our communities. This is the most radical form of abundance. I mean, we all think smartphones are amazing and they are, but can they self-replicate? No, <laughs> the seeds are the most genius self-replicating creatures on the planet. And when we save them and when we share them, these are some of the most fundamental currencies and probably the most important currency of our time and of our species. I mean, we wouldn't, if we hadn't started saving seeds 10,000 years ago, we wouldn't have written languages. We wouldn't have structures like we do now. We wouldn't have <laughs> all, so many of the things that we know of as culture. And so, yes, thank you for saving seeds. Thank you for knowing that seeds and you are not as small as you seem. And that even in this era where it's so hard to have hope, saving seeds, I hope, can surround you with the faith, just most viable, vigorous sense as it surrounds me. So thank you all so much for joining me. Thank you again, Kira and Max, for sharing your great gifts of language justice with us. Stacy, thank you. And thank you all the various libraries of the greater Rochester area for making it possible happen tonight. And most of all, thank you, everyone who has showed up to this conversation. Thank you for asking questions. And thank you for just, you know, finding that spark of curiosity in yourself. And I hope that this is just the beginning of the rest of our lives and the rest, the many, many more conversations to come. Thank you, Petra. And thank you to all of you who have attended. Now go out and make the world a better place. Plant some seeds. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>